Thanks to your generous donations to our Kickstarter funding campaign. Life Barker Podcast presents Fundraising Inferno 5. Our, our second audio commentary for uh, Clive Barker Podcast presents Fundraising Inferno 5. This one is The Forbidden, uh, the longer of the two movies that usually get packaged together on a, you know, in, in, on a DVD or Blu-ray or VHS. Mm-hmm. So the, the Forbidden, there's a lot more to talk, and it's longer than Salome. Yeah, the, yeah the, the Forbidden is like 50 minutes, right? It's 50, yeah, 50 minutes. Um, and filmed over the course of like 73 to eight or 78, I think for, mm-hmm. five, for five years. Yeah. But there was a hiatus between this. So they, they weren't always like doing it. Yeah. And it was never quite finished until 1993 when it was edited by, was it Peter Whittle that we yes. talked about in the, in the last commentary? Yep. Yep. And it was filmed in 16 millimeters. So Whereas uh, Salome was filmed in eight millimeters, which makes it a smaller resolution. But uh, so yeah, this one it, it relates a lot to Hellraiser. If you yeah. read the book, because we're using the Blu-ray from the Scarlet Box, we're using the Clyde Barker Legacy Blu-ray to watch this. Uh, you can watch, you can watch it in the standalone DVD, or you can watch it on the Redemption video release from the '90s, um, which <laughs> has that funny intro that we mentioned in Salome's commentary. So, uh, yeah, read the Damnation Games book written by Phil and Sarah Stokes that came with it and the opening chapters of it talk a lot about the Forbidden. They even have, like, uh, the entire script of it, and they mention how the story evolved over time and how this has different elements that would resurface again in Hellraiser. Um, So, yeah, go check that out. So we're, again, we're using the... um the Scarlet Box version from the Clive Barker Legacy disc on in that, um, but you can use any any edition that you want, um, and we'll we'll count down and we're watching it without the introduction. So let's cool. See. So let's see. I I got my uh, menu on the Forbidden and uh, three, two, one, play. Okay, here we go. I also remember uh, Claude said he's trying to get some funding for this this movie, and he sent a letter to some people, and they he's talking about how you know you know the response was you know he was giving him a pitch about the story and how you know it was like this you know this beautiful you know uh, sublime and wonderful <laughs> moment of unveiling yeah, when yeah, the angels is... skin uh, Peter Atkins' character Faust. And then he got the letter back, was like, what a sublime and wonderful about being skinned. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) And it's it's interesting here, we open with uh, this weird clown, and then there's a page from a textbook uh, representing science uh, burning away. And I think that, if I'm not mistaken, I think I wrote here in my notes that that was supposed to be the first law of thermodynamics in there. So that's interesting. Uh, And Uh, that that clown in the opening looked like Clive Barker in a bathroom. mm Mm-hmm. All so this here, stuff with like the those I guess the mathematics and stuff always kind of reminds me of the puzzle box in a way too, like yeah. solving something or yeah. You know, uh, well, absolutely. I mean, if you read the the Damnation Game yeah uh, uh, chapter, this this hieroglyphic thing that uh, Faust, the character of Faust, is supposed to be doing here, that was uh, it, it's a different version of like an opening of the box like yeah. he's going to put this together yeah. the, he's going to create this elaborate configuration and that's going to be what brings about um you know the here it is yeah. so it's going to bring like this this demon into our world and it's going to open up the gates for him to go to a another dimension so of course that's peter atkins right there yes with a full head of hair and a Full beard. beard. 
kind of strange the, scene, yeah. It was the seventies. That, that shot right there of that uh bug or yeah, the shot the of the, yeah, it reminded me of the the shot of the ro the the roach from Hellraiser too. Oh, yeah. oh okay. So here is ceremoniously washing himself, preparing for a ritual, I guess. Yeah, ritual. Yeah, yeah. a lot like the ritual in the Hellbound Heart, with with the, in, with the doves' heads and the jars of urine, and making sure everything's perfect. It's a very ritualized behavior that uh, every time someone's going to do something or some sort of ceremony, first thing we do is go take a shower, change into your best clothes, yeah. get ready for the ritual. Yeah, and there's oh, there's the black birds too, which you know, of mm -hmm. course, where they come back in the Hellbound Heart and and Hellraiser. In Hellraiser, I think you only hear them; you don't see them. But this uh, the script for this movie started out being called Faustus, and then it became the Demon, and then it even had another uh, name, I think. Um, which let me see, I forgot, I forgot which one that was. But anyway, when it was the Demon. Um, yeah, the, the film scenario would open up in a room that clearly describes a bedroom in which much of the test makeup shots for the films were photographed and which would feature prominently in the Forbidden's footage. It would say, uh, fade up on a room empty. It has a square latticed window, very simple, white walls, white floorboards, black window frame and lattice work, no curtains. And, um, so yeah, on one wall opposite the window, there would be a reproduction of Jerry Colt's Horse Frightened by Lightning. No other ornament and a blue bulb. So, and then of course we would see Faustus's character, and uh... and it's interesting how in Clive's stories you got um, people obsessively solving puzzles, or you know the puzzle box, or untying knots. I think was that in the Inhuman Condition. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Yes. The Inhuman Condition. So Clive had, in fact, it says here in the Damnation Games, Clive had, in fact, work on a further outlined version of The Forbidden, which broke the film down into 435 camera shots and included directions for both sound effects and dialogue. Uh -huh. So if you read the book, Damnation Games, you'll find that there are lines of dialogue here that were supposed to go into some of these images and scenes. Um, so if you go there to page 28 of Damnation Games, you will find that the, the, the all the shots lined up together and... Um, all the dialogue that was supposed to be a part of it. It's interesting then when they when they re-edited this in in 1993, it seemed more like an act of preservation than uh, you know than trying to meet the director's original vision. Yes. And uh, another thing that says here, the draft distills the piece to more clearly focus on the Faustian bargain and the symbolism buried in the hieroglyphs, describing the irresistible temptation of the unsolved puzzle that you were talking about earlier, uh, Ryan. The Forbidden of the title. So the, t the, the puzzle is The Forbidden. Uh, on the wall of the prisoner's cell that is ripped to pieces and reassembled in the film. And, and what do you guys think about this nail board scene here? Well, Very rem reminds me of Pinhead. There's something yeah. going on with the grid lines and stuff like that. He's... I think that one is the most obvious reference that everybody talks about. But I don't, I don't quite understand what is happening in the movie with it, though. Yeah, I'm confused about it, too. I think maybe it's maybe like images from the this, I mean this character also kind of reminds me of Frank, in a mm. way. Yeah. Maybe this, he's seeing these in his head because he keeps closing his eyes. Are images from him what he's seeing? Oh, that's a good point. You For know, me, I always thought of this this scene as almost like this um, this kind of interdimensional like space time fabric or something like this grid yeah. of of of. of something that's holding everything together and it's like he's meditating and he's trying to push on through this this weird barrier that we see yeah. that's that's my my take for it uh so and here it take... seems like he finds himself in a in a different place like he's looking around like all of a sudden he's he's folded something and found himself on another side and now he's in yeah and they, they he's filmed in negative and um so was that him putting the puzzle back together or was that somebody was that a demon not sure. Yeah. But as he looks out of the um, he's the window, he's going to see that. World. That's a good point yeah. about all these these nails, Jose. It's, I like that. It's good observation. It's like something is shifting. There's some sort of gears turning. It's like all of a sudden that uh, things are changing, right? The, the the light is changing angle, and for some the reason that's changing. 
Yes, yeah. it seems like something is shifting gears, right? Yes. Huh. Like the box, because yeah. the box shifts gears. So it's I sort think... of symbolizing the, the transition from our world into the the hell world that he's going to. Well, that's just my interpretation. I mean, you can yeah. take it any any way you oh, feel yeah. like. Uh, it's it, very, yeah, it right. will suit your explanation. If, um, if you if you ask Clive Barker, he's just going to say nobody knows what's going on in that movie. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> yes. Yes. I think you'd have to go back in time to ask Clive Barker. You know what what, what that was. Well, when he talks about the, the forbidden, he's mentioned some things like, particularly in the forbidden, the atmosphere of dread and anxiety that hangs over the movie, and obviously the erotic elements and the nails in the nail board. Um, he calls them almost uh, prophetic, in a sense. Uh, these definitely prefigure what we see later in the Hellraiser movies. I think they're an interesting artifact. I am glad they have found their way to video. So that's... that's uh, well, and, this is kind and, of like an early God. idea for a cinephile. And, and over the years, Clive Barker's been asked a lot of times what the origin of Pinhead was, and he gives different answers. You know, like um, I was at a Q&A book signing where he told somebody that one day he had a dream and of Pinhead, and he, he had a little notepad by the toilet, and he got up and sat was sitting on the toilet, and he drew a picture of Pinhead. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. I mean, I think they're probably all true, you know, in their way. Yeah. I love this Kabuki kind of like character. It reminds me of like a Cenobite for some reason. Yeah, yeah, and it's interesting because at first, you know, you think he's a demon, but then he sort of disrobes and he looks like a regular person, but yeah, then, you perfect. know, this is sort of an avant-garde art film, so maybe he still is a demon. Maybe he's taking off his demon you know, well, skin he, and he, becoming a person. Yeah, it's like a... Well, here's what we have from the Forbidden script that's on Damnation Games. It says, The prisoner rips the Forbidden down from the wall, which is the puzzle. The pieces of the picture are intercut with pieces of the Traveler's puzzle, which is now seen to be made from the same design. The prisoner resolves never to sleep again and never to dream. However, he sleeps again, and this time dreams he's in a wilderness, empty even of corpses. And then distantly, he sees a white-faced naked figure. He watches it. Its belly heaves. It bends. The prisoner watches. It turns over like a crab. The prisoner's eye. That's another shot. The bending man has tied himself in an impossible knot like a circus entertainer. Um, so that yeah. is kind of strange, yeah. The demon that the traveler saw undresses. He hangs up his mask on the wall. And then it shows the, the finished work. Um, the torn pieces in the prisoner's room. So these are just the shots. So this is, the shots are only described as like frames. Like, so that's, here's the, the demon. He's going to take off his mask now. Yeah. <coughs> so he got 300 pounds from the Liverpool Film Association after he showed them uh, Salome. Um, which I think he used to make this. Of course, it was never finished, but he said, I showed the man Salome and I was squirming with embarrassment at how rough it was, but he was astonished at what we had achieved. He said this in an interview to Phil and Sarah Stokes on Liverpool Lives 2009. I am not sure who this uh, actor is supposed to be. If it's Phil Rimmer or whoever Yeah, I was going to say, is. is it Phil Rimmer? Because it's a similar hairstyle. I'll have to send a message to Pete and see what he says. Yeah. <clears throat> I know that the woman in the love scene that's going to appear is Lynn Darnell again. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. The film also features that technique where uh, it was printed in negative to give it a an aura of heightened reality, like Peter Atkins says in the introductions, or super reality. So the objects and people were painted in negative, so they would look on film as a fake positive. So again, we have in this movie, of course, uh, another co deep connection to Hellraiser is, of course, the Faustian bargaining, like you said. Uh, that the character of Faust is kind of like Frank. Uh, Frank wants to see more, just like Faust wants to know more about the world. The thing about the original Goethe's Faust is that he's an old man. He devoted his life to science, and then he, he's kind of jaded about it. He's like, well, 
what's the use of science if I can't like live forever? You know, if I can't, I've, I've forgotten how to live. I never had like, I never enjoyed life. I was always stuck with these musty books. And so he tr strikes a, a deal with Mephistopheles to become young again and, and go and find the love of his life and have fun yeah. and be merry. Um, but he kind of it wastes with, it, right? Like he turns himself invisible to spy on people. and Yeah. Well, the thing is, of course, he ends up falling prey to, like, the follies of youth, and he ends up killing his love's brother uh, in a sword fight. And, of course, that kind of throws everything that he was working for away. And it's funny because also these birds that we see, these remind me of, like, the Hellbound Hearts mention of vast blackbirds in Eternal yeah. Tempest. And also about the noise of the birds that we see in Hellraiser when yeah. the the tramp shows up on uh, at the pet store for mm -hmm. visiting Kirsty yeah. and eating like the crickets and then he disappears and we see this like sound of a flock of birds flying away. Yeah. So here's the love scene. In the DVD the earlier DVD, I remember there was uh, names for some of the chapters. And when this demon in the woods appeared, it was called the spirit in the woods. So hmm. I don't know who came up with the names for those scenes, but uh, they were very, very fitting. So here's a love scene. Let's see what it says here in the script. So he was, he was, Faustus was already strangled, so he's dead at this point, right? And he's being shown things. Yeah. This kind of reminds me of the pleasure aspect, I guess, of the Hellraiser. Yeah. Being shown the experience of ultimate right, right, which, pleasure and pain, which is coming up. Yeah, and, and you see a lot more of that in the Hellbound Heart than what they could do in the in Hellraiser. Yeah. Yeah. I think in one of the first drafts for this movie, uh, Faustus would actually make love to Mephistopheles. Clive recalled uh, many years later that one of the inspirations for these pieces was the work of Kenneth Anger, which I first yeah. saw in the late 60s. At the time, my hometown of Liverpool boasted a bourgeoisie art scene and there were small but overfilled screenings of American underground films every few weeks. So, cinema of hallucination, lushly stylized and perversely metaphysical. <laughs> that sounds like something Clive would say. is also quite a bit different from Hellraiser because the focus is almost entirely on what happens you know when in the transition to hell and mm. and Hellraiser is not I mean you, you it's only hinted at well sure I mean the, the thing about avant-garde is that it's not constricted to narrative or, you know, it's the thing about avant-garde is that it, it's almost like it, it is to avant-garde films are to cinema like abstract art is to painting. So it's not there is no need to be actually tied down to like a plot or a narrative yes. or any sort of thing like yeah. that. It's more like a moving picture, if you will. Yeah. You, know, you see you see movies and uh, of course, it came from. The rise of the Surrealists and the uh, the movement of the, the Dada artists, Dadaism, you know, like uh, yeah. Marcel Duchamp or, um, you know, uh, Salvador Dali and Luis Buñuel's uh, movie Chien Andalou, which has the famous scene of cutting the eyeball. Yeah, that's yeah, that's great. And, you know, an another very active filmmaker that I'm a big fan of in the 70s was this guy called Dusan Makavejev or Makavejev and he used to do a lot of stuff with uh, stop motion animation 
And uh, if, if you get a chance to see some of his work, it's, it's pretty cool. And uh, I'm sorry, stop motion animation is um, Svankmeyer. Svankmeyer also made a, a version of Faust, uh, which is pretty cool. That looked like they were really poking his skin with a needle or something. This is yeah, pretty disturbing, even yeah. though I know it's like paint and like, you know, they're just peeling paint from him. It's still pretty gross. Yeah. <laughs> it's just the way it's shot. It's well directed. Mm hmm. Yeah. So that the angels are tattooing the forbidden design on uh, Faust's back. Yeah, and there's um, it's kind of interesting how drawn out it is. It's this sort of long, obsessive, uh, ritualistic thing that they're doing. So it's supposed to be an angel. Here's um here's a, a section from the the available script. It says, "The eye closes." The woman's voice: "Are you awake?" The woman leaning towards the camera: "Prisoner, she's over me." Woman's voice: "Are you awake?" The woman undresses the prisoner. His eyes try to flicker open. Distant, soft clapping. Momentarily, the lattice. It closes again. The woman's finger touches a needle. Prisoner, she intends to kill me. The surface of his skin, his eyes widen with fear. Nail board. Prisoner, more. The needle pricks the skin. Nail board. Prisoner, more, damn you. So this is the part where he's like, you know, feeling the the pleasure part of, of, of the whole process, right? Yeah. Yeah. Here's the forbidden design being completed. Yeah. People back together, yeah. Yeah. I'd love to have that paint, the pic actual picture. I mean, Cloud probably yeah. drew that. I'd love yeah. to have that. And the blackbirds. Yeah. The seventies were really good for this sort of avant-garde. I mean, you also have Alejandro Jodorowsky. He made like this, this, uh, the Magic Mountain, and uh, El Topo. So yeah, some really, Topo. really crazy, ama amazing movies. Have you seen those, Rob? Yeah, yes. El Topo is very good. Yeah, yeah. This snail, I was... It's interesting because that they show that snail and then later there's a symbol that also kind of looks like a snail. Mm -hmm. uh, on the window, I think. Mm -hmm. Wasn't that director uh, you were talking about, Jose, wasn't he going to do a Dune movie? His Dune movie with HRT. Yeah, Jodorowsky, yeah. He yeah. was going to do that in the... the 80s, but that yeah. fell through. So, but because of that, H.R. Giger gets to do a lot of photo shoots of, or photo opportunities of him sitting in the Harkonnen chair that he made. Mm -hmm. there, there. So here's this interesting, interesting shot here, here with the sim, um, which almost seems like supposed to to show something with wings, maybe? I don't know. I think it like, looks like that snail that we just saw. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. Okay. That, yeah, I could see that. Like, the the, the the Y part at the bottom could be, like, the... The head. The eyes, you yeah. know, the stems. And I love this shot here. It's so, uh, so well uh, made with the reflection on the glass. Of course, that's Clive Barker right there. Yeah. Uh, is this another... Is this another kind of uh, angel... Kind of, you know, what, what we're gonna I, this scene think, in another yeah, dance number. I think one of the demon angels, you know, it's just I think off. give him. Pleasure. I think he is representing more like a, a Mephistopheles kind of character because in the original, in one of the very drafts of the script, uh, Mephistopheles would appear with an erection, a crystal erection that would enter uh, Faustus. So, After his dance, so, Mephist so. Mephistopheles wasn't the uh, wasn't the demon that took the mask off and took his clothes off earlier. I don't know. That's okay. just represented as a spirit yeah. in the woods. So, oh, okay, just like a demon. Yeah. Again, like again, this is not something we can actually like. Yeah. Uh, 
attached to an actual plot or narrative. It's right. more it's just like images shown to us and we kind of interpret yeah, them. But it see it does seem like that there's layers and layers of events, you know, for what happens when when uh, he solves the puzzle. Right, right. And again, the, the the whole thing about dancing and uh, yeah, the idea of of dancing as a way to induce an altered state is not a, an old thing. I mean, everybody knows about that. Everybody knows that when you're a kid. I mean, Ryan, you had the other day a memory that you posted on Facebook of Joey discovering that he gets dizzy when he rolls around. Yeah, uh, yeah. that was cute. You know? so cute. <laughs> That's one of the things that we discover when we're kids. It's like, hey, if I just yeah. if I just go around in a circle, I can make myself feel funny, <laughs> right? Yeah. yeah. That is the most basic form of of altering your conscious that we have. Um, and then, of course, you know, you have all these like images of people dancing and in, in, in uh, religious ecstasies or. Uh, yeah, that's a good point. Like speaking the rolling in dervishes in. Uh, in Turkey, right? The rolling dervishes that uh, they just, or what they do is they just roll around and on, on their feet for uh, minutes and hours, I guess, to induce themselves this sort of like trance. This is a little weird and disturbing. And do you think that that effect was like, did he paint black on his face and then it put it in negative? Yes. Yeah. yeah, that's very cool too. I like that. To me, it seems like the demon is is uh, almost talking to him in this weird chittering kind of like language Put from him. hell. Yeah, putting him under like some kind of spell. It's it's a little bit too bad that we don't get dialogue in this because I think that would have added a lot to it. Yeah, <clears throat> if if it was meant to have any. Uh... But here, I like the fact that in the background you see almost like an animation of the dance. Yeah, right? the yeah, that, light. yeah, that weird like it's, it's almost a stick figure. Yeah, this is like a, a kind of a possession dance uh, that Clive is doing, which is, again, very, very strange and weird. But uh, he almost doesn't but, look human in a way. He almost looks like almost like an alien. Well, like, kind of. Yeah, yeah. Like, the, like the way his forearms are, are yeah, un unnaturally thin. Yeah, exactly. wailing around. Yeah. Back when Clive was um, 19, 20, yeah. 21. Yeah. Now, what is that shot of like intercutting with like something shaking in between? It looks like um, I'll, show, I'll point it out when it comes up again. It comes up again. Yeah, they use some dry, uh, dry pieces of uh, vegetation. They put on top of a right there. That's yeah. Uh, they know. put this on top of a, a record player, and uh -huh. uh, they just <laughs> spun it around. Oh, yeah. Cool. So. You almost does the viewer get kind of <laughs> the trend trans? When I was watching it yesterday, I was kind of like. Oh, you know, I'm getting kind of taken away yeah. to another. I don't know, you know. It's a little mystifying, yeah. In, yeah. In, in both of these movies, it's it's uh, it, you kind of forget yourself, and you know, we're, we're supposed to be doing an audio commentary. I keep forgetting to talk. Yeah, I <laughs> know. <laughs> They're very, you know, so yeah. they suck you into the yeah. their worlds. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, spirit possession and and dancing has a um, has a big connection. Uh, between it and uh like i said uh, it seems almost like this this dance is meant to mesmerize and it does a little bit yeah but you know it's easy to just look past the the hidden layers or the the symbolism of what it means like clive barker mentioned that a lot of the stuff that it they filmed this way because it was some sort of encoded information that they wanted to transmit in a different way like to to induce a sort of, it's more like, uh, like when I was doing the notes for this, I was like, you can only make so much notes for an avant-garde film. It's also also about how it makes you feel at the time yeah. that you're watching. It. Yeah, it's, exactly. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So. You can also check the Clyde Barker archive for, uh, some press material that they have available about Salome and the Forbidden. In the Damnation games, there's actually a, a deleted image of Peter Atkins, and it's like, it's an image of him, he looks like a mummy kind of modified character where he's wrapped up in bandages. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It never made it into the film. He was supposed to be a bandaged prisoner. Yeah. 
that's also in one of the earlier um, drafts. And uh, the original, uh, this set that's kind of in this, uh, uh, this character is supposed to be in like this locked kind of, you know, I guess, room. And it seems like a room to me. It was originally, originally for uh, Peter Atkins when he wrote the Hellbound script, he based the set um, off this for that, for, you know, when, you know. Oh, uh, I see. But when he got on set for Hellbound, he was like, what, well, what are y'all shooting here? Because he he did they had changed it he didn't expect it to be such such this big lush like you know yeah yeah the damp room the damp room definitely has uh, a parallel with the room that Faustus is in this movie because there's yeah. just it's a bare room single bulb just uh, and except instead of being painted white it's it's black it's dirty it's dingy yeah. it's damp yeah. and there's a big room with a lattice on it that's kind of covered and and Frank looks out of it and sees like. He sees like things through that hole in the, just like Faustus does in this movie. Yeah. So yeah, that's that's an interesting uh, parallel there as it's well. It's kind of oh. almost like a jail cell in this one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It is, and, and Faustus is describing the uh, draft of the script almost like as a prisoner in some uh, shots. It, it is said like the prisoner looks out of the window, so. It's it, like I said. It's it's in, it's easy for some reviews of this movie to just focus get a little on hung up on this and part. the fact that uh, yeah, yeah, focus on this part and say that yeah, you know, Clive. Bar I think it was bloody disgusting that said something like, "Yeah, here's a word of warning. You may see Clive Barker dance in in the nude, and let's say he's more than a little happy to do so." And it's yeah. I was like, yeah, I guess you could focus on that, but uh, you could also focus on the fact that you know it's a possession dance. You know, talk about. Talk about that. Talk about the tradition of yeah. Don't focus on the you know just the altering your simple, conscience. Yeah, yeah through exactly. dance. And, yeah. Don't focus on the simple flesh aspects of you know. And here's movie. Clive kind of disappearing out of shot. That's cool. I like that. Yeah. He had a ponytail. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I like that. And another thing that's interesting, I thought, is that in the beginning, it was described that the painting on the wall of the Faustus room would have been um, that painting by Jerry Colt, um, Horse Scared by Lightning. And if you look at that painting, I think that you can draw some parallels with the Faustus character's present condition, because it's just a horse with a background of a storm behind him, but the horse is just laying still. And it seems at first you can't tell that he's scared, but at the same time you look at him, you see that he's like rigid, he's immobilized, he's scared, he's not moving because he's not in the dynamic pose. And this is kind of like the thing here is like he's just laying there, but he's immobilized after this dance. So he's it's almost like he's immobilized and paralyzed with fear. And now we can begin. Yeah. So this, I mean, considering the crude sort of technology that they used for this, this is amazingly, you know, disturbing. Yes. Like Rob, like you were saying earlier, I mean, the the peeling the layers of paint off of his skin, it, it really does, you know, look like the, the, the ritualistic way that they do it really does kind of make you feel like, yeah, they're peeling it back and cutting it away from the muscle and... Yeah. Yeah. Of course, they were using white paint that now looks uh, dark like blood. Yeah. And also, I wouldn't put it past Clive and, and the rest of the people to actually have looked at how properly to flay a man. Because you, you go and you flay him, you, you cut down, you know, per, uh, lengthwise on the limbs, and then you pull the skin back very gently, and that's how you flay um Clyde Barker actually saw an autopsy once. Yeah. So the technique they used was it started early in the morning and they had Peter Atkins lay on a table and they would paint successive layers of wet paint onto his body. Each layer had different designs to represent the different like sections flesh, of muscle. skin. Yeah, flesh, yeah. muscle. So, and then they just let it dry and then painted the other layer and then let that dry. And then they carefully, like, peel it back. And uh, 
to this day, every time I see someone pull like a, <laughs> one of those masks that you apply to your face and then you just pull it out and it comes out like in this layer of rubbery stuff, it, it always yeah. reminds me of the forbidden. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> It's a very bloody, very gory scene, but very striking as well. The gore looks like it's just, you know, yeah, wet, wet kind of paint. Mm -hmm. But it's still, like I say, it's just the way it's shot, all these, like, close-ups, the way, you know. And the meticulous way that they're cutting every single finger, they're cutting down every single yeah. finger so they can yeah. peel it out and just lay it flat. Have you guys ever seen a, a movie with Ewan McGregor? I think it's directed by Peter Greenway called... Uh, uh, the pillow book? No, not not the pillow book. What what's it called? Uh, let me see. It's an early movie with Ewan McGregor, and uh, it is called. Let's see. Oh man, I forgot that that movie. Anyway, go ahead and say what you were going to say. I'll get back to this. Um, nice camera shot. I like how that the camera shot kind of goes around. He's moving around these these uh, angels as they you know yeah. cut around him. It's nice camera movements too. Ugh. Demons to some, yeah. angels to others. Yeah, <laughs> it, that, and, uh, that's interesting too. That doesn't really get uh, explored that much. That idea that it depends on your point of view or. And okay, my, I'm going back. To yeah, sorry, go ahead. Oh, you know, go ahead. I was going to say, I, yeah, it is called The Pillow Book, that movie I was talking about with Ewan McGregor. It's an interesting book. It's directed by Peter Greenway. And if you watch that book, it's about a woman <clears throat> that has a body writing fetish. And she is looking for a lover who would have the same, uh, the same, not only the same fetish, but also who would be a uh, accomplished calligrapher. And um, she she falls in love with Ewan McGregor, and then there's a sequence where Ewan McGregor dies, and his body is turned into a book. His skin is turned into a book. Oh, it's a fascinating I'll movie. Check I, it out. It's called Pillow yeah. Book. I hope I didn't spoil anything for anybody, but go check that that movie out, The Pillow Book from 1996, Jeez, directed yeah. by Peter Greenaway. It's a very interesting, very sophisticated, very. If you know Peter Greenaway, you know his movies are very uh, visually stimulating. So go sounds, check that movie out. It sounds like it was um, influenced by the Book of Blood. Wow. So here's the skin being taken out. Yeah, yeah, it is just it is disturbing, even when you know that it's just layers of paint. But it reminds me of like taking the skin off of a chicken. <laughs> yeah. Shit. Hey, I like the crispy skin on the chicken. Yeah, I yeah, know. <laughs> now I'm getting hungry. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> go to, hey, go get hey some Pete. KFC afterwards. Hey, Pete, <laughs> if, you're, if you're listening to this, uh, great job. Great job. Yeah, man. Yeah. Yeah, that can't be good for you to have all that skin, that all that paint painted right onto your skin. I mean, I don't think that, uh, you know, they probably didn't really know, Let's... you know, that it kind of suffocates the skin to put all that on there. And he did that all day. Yeah. It's an all day thing. Yeah. That was a nice shot of his face as they were removing the skin under his eyes. His eyes looked very Of course, we know, we know Pete Atkins came out of it okay. Yeah, he's all right. <laughs> yeah. Still laughing and, you know, yeah. cutting jokes right. till this day. Yeah. I wish that he was going to be there for the Texas Frightmare weekend. Yeah, yeah. I do. I do, too. I, I think that would be perfect. You know, he would be great in a in a, um, in a Hellraiser um, Q&A, you know, thing at the... We should ask him if he uh, plans on uh, going there, even if he's not a, a guest. Yeah, maybe. I actually did Maybe ask. Just to see. Oh, you okay. did? Uh, he, yeah, he's not. I don't think he has okay. any plans of going. He doesn't really. Have, I don't think he That's likes the, to do those kinds of things. Well, I know they they typically focus more on actors and directors, and he was a writer for Hellbound, but he's a big part of Hellraiser. Oh yeah, definitely yeah, huge part. Well, 
Well, and I, I think it's also interesting that, you know, I guess we had talked about this before, that Paul T. Taylor lives right there, but he's not going to be there, you know? I understand that. I mean, it would be awkward to have two pinhead actors in the same convention, so. Yeah. Well, but they're 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 deliberately doing that for with Jason. Mm-hmm. I think because it's the Texas Frightmare Weekend's 13th annual one, and so they're doing a big Friday the 13th thing. Man, that really does look like his ribcage, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. <clears throat> they they kind of painted shadows on there, maybe to to make it look that way. Sure, yeah. So this uh, surgery scene, so they <clears throat> they had the three hundred pound grant from the Merseyside Arts Association, so they started shooting in seventy five, but then they kind of stalled in seventy six. They were doing other stuff. They were doing plays with the dog company and. And then the filming recommenced in 77 when they relocated to London from Liverpool. And this is where most of the surgery stuff was shot. It says here, all the surgery stuff is London, says Clive. All the abstractive stuff, you know, where, where the images flip in front of the camera, that was all images stuck on pieces of card and then put on a record player, gramophone, turntable, and flipped in front of the camera. All the stuff with the nail board and the shadows, all that was done down in London. Huh. The notorious sequence with the erection and the dancing was shot in the back room of the house in Mount View, whereas Lynn tattooing Pete was shot in Liverpool in a long, narrow bedroom. All the wow. stuff of Pete looking out the lattice work from The Forbidden was shot there and the love scene. We painted the whole room white. It wasn't a big room, but it looked certainly spacious when it was white. We took all the furniture out and shot there for probably six months in beats and pieces. There you go. Yeah, and 300 pounds back then would have been about $600. Mm-hmm. And, um, and then, of course, uh, that scene that we see at the end that where he's going to walk around flayed and then strike a, a pose um, is very reminiscent of uh, Andreas Vesalius. Uh, oh, yeah, the anatomy book. The anatomy book that he did, uh, yes. Hey, he's he's, he's uh, walking around flight in that same kind of world that he was looking out into at the beginning, right? Right. Oh, he's reached the, I guess, the forbidden kind of like. So here he is walking. I'm guessing Clive drew that, uh, the background. Backdrop, backdrop. yeah. Yeah. It's very, very uh, visually interesting scene here, and and I would love. I, I actually I did this as a project once. I actually got a copy of the Forbidden, and then I reversed the negative effect, oh. and uh, I, yes, I did that. Um, <laughs> and it was interesting to to see. I mean, it was very, very interesting to look at it. Yeah. What What did you do now? I reversed the negative effect on the Forbidden once. And uh, just you know, I, I I saw the movie completely reversed, in positive. Oh, cool. To to see what to... It, what what the act what they were looking at when they filmed it. That's, yeah. that's a cool idea. Oh, cool. Yeah. So and oh. then the Vesalius uh, work is called the Humani Corporis Fabrica. So it's a a book of anatomy written by Andreas Vesalius, in uh, in the 1500s. And then there's this abrupt ending, and we've got. Clive Barker Clive. from 93, you know, talking about it. And was this in, I can't remember if they tagged this on the end of the, of the redemption video too. They did. They did. They did. Okay. Yeah. And I just want to bring up another interesting thing that, uh, our second t-shirt that we sold on the Kickstarter where, uh, you know, Rob, you said maybe we could have like a giant, you know, three eyes on an Island or something. And the little guy I put on the boat in front of the, the skull with the three eyes it is yeah. actually the silhouette taken from Andreas Vesalius, oh. the Hormani Corporis Fabrica. <laughs> it's one of the poses. That's right. That's right. Yeah. And it is that. the pose that I think Peter Atkins strikes there at the end of The Forbidden. So, uh, right. yeah. I, yeah. That's, that's very deep. That. And if anybody's interested, we do still have some of those T-shirts left. We have large and extra large still. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> you got to nice. pimp those nice T-shirts out. Yeah. Nice plug, Ryan. Yeah. <laughs> the, even though the Kickstarter is over. If it's we, true, if but we you know, let, let them, us know. We might bring them to Texas Frightmare Weekend. Yep. So that was the Forbidden. Thank you so much for joining us, watching these two 
very fascinating avant-garde films that oh, yeah. uh, Clive and his friends did back in uh, 1975 to 1977. Yeah, yeah, it, it was fun. Actually, I, I have to admit, you know, the, for me, Salome was a lot harder to understand um, in the beginning, but your, your commentary... Your analysis, yeah, your analysis. Oh, thanks. Really yeah. yeah, and th this one was a little easier to understand, especially, you know, having read... I've read... I, this morning, I read some parts of the damnation games which helped um, yeah that that book is pretty amazing yeah it is really good now i want to go read that whole book it says oh, me here it is. adrian carson oh, yeah no, there's adrian a credit. carson and they've got yeah. they're showing a, a scene from salome on here for the end credits for the forbidden yeah but i guess it was all put together as one movie originally in the on the vhs and dvd yeah So thank you again for yes, joining us for joining this. Us. And this podcast, having no beginning, will have no end. All right. Oh, those were great. I liked watching those with you all. I like doing the commentaries with you guys. Yeah, yeah. that's fun. I actually was be... the other way around. I, I mean, I, I understand a lot more of the Salome, and I don't understand the Forbidden at all. But <laughs> reading this book really, really helped so, to understand what Clive was trying to do. Yeah, okay. I used to, I mean, before I, when I watched this, it was just like, well, this is in my collection now because I'm a completist for Clive Barker, but I don't understand uh -huh. it at all, and I think I only watched it like twice. Right. <laughs> well, I went online and looked at the Bible and trying to see, you know, if Clive was staying strictly to a biblical, you know, kind of like, you know, storyline, but now that you told me it's based off Oscar Wilde's, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. his version that I want to go check that out now yeah the mark gospel doesn't have a lot about this it just has like a couple maybe a couple three lines about salome's dance and saint john the yeah. baptist and stuff like that so it the whole story has been romanticized in movies and and theater plays and it's been expanded and people have you know created a lot more to fill in the the story gaps so uh yeah that's from uh oscar wilde salome play well, so I go think check that largely because of you, Jose, I think our commentary might be the only place where you can hear somebody explaining what's going on in, in, in Salome. Because that's... I don't yeah. know. I mean, there's probably a lot of people out there like me that are like, I don't know what's going on, whatever, you know? Sure. Sub <laughs> like a subtext to it. Yeah. I, th I, I, I think you can most follow, people I mean, know. You can follow it as a regular viewer what's happening. Yeah. You can probably just figure out with the images, like, well, this, she's doing this you know but the dancing trying to well, you know right. even the even the dancing is like they don't show her next to king herod it's like it's like she was they were filmed that separate from his reactions and i don't know yeah well i i know at least most people will know that Salome danced for king herod and then she asked for you know john the baptist's head so that's pretty much what they know about Salome if they ever even read yeah. that part so i don't know right but I, to my knowledge, there's no commentary track for these things. So yeah. we might have done the first and only commentary track for these yeah. <laughs> yeah, short films. So <laughs> Clyde Barker podcast, breaking new ground. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And this podcast having no beginning will have no end. Find the show notes for this episode and join the discussion over at www.clivebarkercast.com where we have news and links to all the ways you can connect with us. You can subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, and every other place you can find podcasts. The Clive Barker Podcast is an independent editorial podcast and news blog that is not affiliated with or under contract by Seraphim Inc. This is a labor of love by the fans for the fans. Thanks for listening.